Welcome back, my darling critters. Last week, we got the huge reveal that Dusk is a secret agent of the Unseely Court. This week, we get the party versus party combat that we were all expecting. Or was it combat? I have some thoughts. Who am I? I am the booktube goddess, the number one drag queen booktuber on YouTube. I analyze critical role in terms of story, and we are on episode 29 of the Bell's Hells campaign. Let's just jump right into it. At Imahara Joe's, Fern has just been reunited with her mother, Bertie. Dusk reveals herself to be a shapeshifter, secret agent of the Unseelie Court, whose real name is Yu Sufiad. Yu grabs a hold of Bertie and Fern. Then everything went to shit. <laughs> I had said before, back when we, the audience, first found out that Dusk was a secret agent, how tricky it is when Players fight players because one of the baseline guides for D&D to work is for the players to work together as a team. It's just weird. It's not natural and super awkward when players fight amongst themselves. I don't know if you've ever been in a campaign where that's happened. Usually it's because someone is a hothead but it really is uncomfortable. But here we have a player conflict that is part of the storyline that Matt has created. So all bets are off. However, I think we saw how reluctant everyone was to really fight Dusk, or I guess we should call them you. And it all really made sense because the person playing you, Erica Ishii, was sitting right there at the table with everyone else. I think if you were an NPC, the party would have reacted a lot differently. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And while you're there, like this video, subscribe to this channel, and do all those booktube things. Mostly what happened was the party tried to neutralize the situation. Orem was probably the most proactive, trying to get you to back off and disarming them. The main goal of most of the party was trying to figure out what was going on and to get information out of both you and Bertie, which was a little difficult since they were trying to kill each other. Though mostly it was Bertie trying to kill you. And I think it was fairly obvious that you wouldn't have been able to do much because they were so greatly outnumbered and no one would have let you kill Bertie, much less Fern. Although she did have an ace in her pocket, which she didn't play. But then Fern. Oh, lovely Fern. Fern chooses to side with her mother and stabs you with her flame blade. <laughs> that's when Matt orders everyone to roll initiative, and that's when we know that shit is going to get real. Wait, what do you, what, if I was born under a- Choose, you believe me or you believe this person? <sighs> okay. Um, I produce, um, my, my flame blade at third level, and I stick it into your belly. Oh! <laughs> okay. At this point, at this point, I think we're gonna roll initiative. Holy oh, no. shit! Oh, 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 Lots of money. Oh, man. But for me, the combat was a little unsatisfying. Since everyone was holding back, it never really escalated to a full fight scene. It could have gone that way because 
the Acer pocket that you had was a mirror that could summon shadows, which may have leveled the playing field. But mostly we ended up with the party successfully restraining both you and Birdie and finding out that Birdie was a wanted criminal by both the Unseelie and Seely courts. And she had stolen something from the Unseelie courts. We also find out that Fern's grandmother, Maury, was not a blood relative, but a family friend who apparently controlled some part of the Fey realm and has some significant powers, which may have been responsible for the time dilation since 90 years passed for Fern and only seven years for everyone else. But that was never confirmed. I think there is still some question of what happened with this time warp. Another big reveal is that Fern's parents are working with the Nightmare King. Where that's going to go is anyone's guess. Eventually, Bertie convinces everyone that she and her husband Ollie are doing what they're doing to try to save Fern, who is, big reveal, Rudy is born. And they're also trying to save the entire Feywell because of visions of the Rudius moon burning up the entire realm. Yu agrees to hold off for a month until the Apogee Solstice to let Birdie have a chance to prove that there does seem to be some threat to the Feywild. The party lets Yu go at this point and thus we end the saga of Dusk. That was a roller coaster. At first, I wasn't that impressed with the character of Dusk. Then I was blown away by the reveal that she was some sort of assassin secret agent and was frankly a little bit nervous about how that would work out. I'm not mad how it ended, but frankly, I felt it was like letting air out of a balloon. The Dusk story didn't end with a bang, it just sort of petered out. Now, if you disagree, let me know. The rest of the episode was a party meeting a new character, Bertie's friend, Han Deer, who was a very paranoid goblin researcher living basically in a bomb shelter. <laughs> we get a lot of lore reveals, which I think were pretty interesting, Hondir is a member of the Grim Verity, the group investigating the Red Moon. They are being hunted down by what he calls the Grey Assassins. The Loomis twins were also members of the Grim Verity, and Orem still thinks the Grey Assassins were the ones responsible for the attack on the Ashari that killed his husband, which is his whole reason for being on this mission. We also find out that Hondir knew, or at least met, Imogen's mother, because she was part of the research project back in Yeos. Now there's a whole lot of lore about the Apogee Solstice and Ley Lines and everything converging in the Hellcatch Valley. The biggest reveal was that the Grim Verity discovered ancient texts about two gods who disappeared from known history about the time that Rudius first appeared in the skies. Apparently the major religions kept this a closely guarded secret because it would destroy the faith of their followers or something. I didn't really quite follow that logic. If you did, feel free to explain it to me down below. We end the episode with everyone, including Hondir, traveling to Birdie's hideout where they hope to be able to complete the device that will reveal more information about the Rudius Moon. This is a turning point episode in my opinion, meaning our whole focus has shifted from the party being basically bounty hunters trying to bring Armand Treshi to justice to now figuring out 
what is going on with the red moon? <laughs> there are so many questions. Fern's parents are working with the Nightmare King, who once worked with Armand Treshi, who is connected to Odahan Fool, the woman in Imogen's dream. Is the Nightmare King playing Fern's parents? Is Rudius even a moon? Or is it a prison for missing gods? What's the connection to the Calamity campaign? So much has been revealed that the goals of the party has completely shifted focus. I am very excited for next week when we'll hopefully get to see Bertie and Ollie's experiment come to a conclusion. But will we also see Ira, the Nightmare King? If so, I think fireworks are going to fly. Oh, and don't forget about Delilah. She's still a wild card waiting for Matt to play. Until we meet again, may all the books you read and the campaigns you play in be blessed. <laughs>